Okay, so it, it is um, my honor and privilege to welcome you to the next part of our program, which is the Paul Chang Memorial Lecture. Um, and as part of this lecture, we uh, uh, give an award, which I'm actually going to invite a couple of other people to, to talk about. But before we do that, um, I just want to say a quick word about Paul Chang, which we will hear far more about in a minute. But Paul um, was a graduate of our School of Social Work, and he really amplifies many of the things that we hope that social workers will do that, out there in the field. Um, he stood up for human rights when it wasn't necessarily popular. He blazed a trail where there wasn't a trail. He helped set up services where um, there were none. And he just generally um, uh, stood up for all those important social justice pieces of social work that we hold very dear. Um, and I just also would like to thank Marion uh, Mann, who uh, generously provided a bequest in his name so that we can hold this lunch every year and the lecture. So we're really lucky today to have Marion with us. So I'd like to thank you very much. And then I'd like to turn the mic over to uh, uh, Dr. Barbara Lee, who will say a few words on the um, like see a Paul Chang. Thank you. Um, the Inspiring Social Work of the Year Award is a jo joint recognition in, of the spirit and professionalism of social work from the UBC School of Social Work and BC ASW, the British Columbia Association of Social Workers. Um, so we're going to hear quite a lot about UBC. Uh, today and over the course of the weeks. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Diane Kate, who's the Executive Director of BC ASW, to share more about the association uh, before I talk more about the award. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. It's a real buzz of excitement both in this room and out on the campus. So this is one of the highlights of the fall for me. This is about prep being, taking pride in our profession. Is my voice coming across okay? Yeah, maybe we'll take that up here. Anyway, social workers are not particularly good about taking credit. We seem to be a very humble, however passionate profession. As a result, the downside of that is that many people do not know about the extent of our work, the depth of our work, and the passion of our work. So in terms of the association, we have three jobs, three purposes. One, to promote the profession. Two, to support the members. And three, to speak for social justice. We're a voluntary association. We invite students to join, we encourage you, we give you an incentive on your fees. And here I am today on behalf of the association to speak a bit to our job of promoting the profession. By being part of this award, what we're doing is we're celebrating social work. And what better example of this work than the work of Paul Chen? And very closely after that, Jacqueline is going to speak more about her work. And they're representative of a sea of social workers who were, there are too many to name and honor. And besides, even if we ask, they might refuse, being that humble profession I spoke of earlier. But it's so important to talk about this work and what a great way to start off in terms of your, your studies. So I encourage you to learn more about the BC Association of Social Workers. We're not the college, that's your regulatory body, and we're split by law in BC. Every profession is. So there's the association and the college. The college's sole function is to regulate the profession. We are the ones who are here to support the and yourself 
as you learn more about the profession and you take part as a social worker. I also want to mention that we're going to have a conference in March 2020 and invite you to keep your eyes open for more information on that. So I don't want to take up more time because I really want you to hear more about Paul Chang and also about Jacqueline's work. So Barbara, back to you. Social Work of the Year Award. And each year we receive incredible nominations of social workers who make a tremendous impact in the lives of individuals, families, and communities. And as a committee, we really have a hard time to recognize just one. And so um, we've identified all of the nominees on a handout which uh, should be distributed to each of the tables to be able to look over. The award is intended to recognize social workers in British Columbia whose personal and professional efforts in service to the marginalized people of our community have inspired others to follow in their footsteps with professionalism, care, compassion, and an unwavering dedication to promote social justice, just like Paul Chang, of whom this award was established in the way up. Paul Chang was a social worker for over 40 years. He was an MSW graduate of the School of Social Work. But he began his social work career uh, in Hong Kong. And when he immigrated to Canada, he worked in a wide scope of community services, including MCP as a resource social worker, then as a manager of Vancouver Detox uh, through MCP, then Mosaic, and Success. Throughout the years, Paul was well respected by his colleagues, supervisors, and students. He went above and beyond what the job required because to Paul, social work was not just a job, it's a calling. It's the ability to make a positive in impact and positive difference in the lives of others. When a boat full of Fijian Chinese refugees arrived on the shores of British Columbia in 1999, Paul was one of the very first to assist the critical situation of human trafficking. He worked day and night, and I heard from Marion 12 to 14 hours a day to help with the immediate crisis and continued this work over the months uh, that followed to ensure the appropriate care and settlement uh, of the refugees. Paul was awarded the Gold Award from the Public Service Employee Relations Committee for his service to the public in such an extraordinary and unprecedented situation. As a supervisor, he importance of the connection and relational aspects of the work. Over his career, Paul supervised a number of international exchange students and spent a lot of time with the students. Not just on the job, but including on the weekends to show them around the city and to ensure they were well, well settled in Vancouver. Students called him the best teacher in the world, and even in passing, many former students from years past traveled far to celebrate his life. He really made an impact in, in the lives of the people that he uh, met. Paul was an inspiration to all the lives that he touched. His life exemplified what a social worker can achieve. He believed in the ripple effect, in where a positive change and inspiration can be passed on from one to another and to another. And in memory of Paul Chang, this inspiring Social Work of the Year Award has been established to highlight those who live the passion of the social work calling and to continue the ripple effect that once shone bright in Paul Chang's life. This year's Inspiring Social Work of the Year Award goes to Jacqueline Sauer. And to introduce Jacqueline, one of the nominators, Harvey Bosma, the Social Work Professional Practice Leader of Providence Health Care, will introduce. Social work at Providence Healthcare, which is a large healthcare organization in Vancouver. And I want to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about Jacqueline and the organization where we both work. Um, I'm very delighted and honored to introduce Jacqueline, um, who is a 
this is the end of this year is the time of social worker of the year award. Um, driven by compassion and social justice, we are at the forefront of exceptional care and innovation. I think it's a statement that would catch the attention of most social workers. And in fact, it is actually the vision statement of the health organization where we work. It's embedded in our mission statement. And I'm very grateful to be working for an organization that is so values driven and with many values that align very closely with the profession of social work. And I know that that's one of the primary reasons that Jacqueline works at Providence Healthcare today. Jacqueline's practice is firmly grounded in the framework of social justice and human rights. And I would say that it's what guides her and informs her in her work each and every day. Prior to coming to Providence, Jacqueline worked in the anti-violence sector for several years. Since coming to Providence in 2015, she's worked mostly in the area of mental health and substance use. And in that role, she works with some of the most vulnerable and marginalized people in our city. Because of her commitment to social justice, Jacqueline intervenes at different levels. At a macro level, she strongly advocates for change to regional, to provincial, to federal policies, and to systems to address the social determinants of health, such as poverty, and homelessness, and racism and racialization. At a micro level, she sees each client as a unique individual with a personal story. She engages with respect and with curiosity and with compassion. She's a key member of an interdisciplinary team at St. Paul's Hospital. She challenges her team to critically consider their actions beyond the confines of the parameters of the medical model and to think outside of the box of convention and the status quo. She's an educator to her team. She's a mentor to social work students, as well as to medicine, nursing, and pharmacy learners. She's a sought-after speaker and teacher. Jacqueline's smart. She's a critical thinker. She's always keen to learn, and she's committed to developing and applying best practices in her work. And as a colleague, she's kind and caring. She's modest. She has a great sense of humor. She's been a true inspiration to her social work colleagues, but also to colleagues of different disciplines. And ultimately, she makes a positive difference to the lives of clients and day in her work. Jacqueline is very well deserving of the inspiring Social Worker of the Year Award. Please join me in welcoming Jacqueline to the podium to deliver the Pauline Memorial Lecture. My worst nightmare. <laughs> okay. So, as a settler to this land, I want to first start by acknowledging that the land on which we gather today is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. Thank you to Harvey for the wonderful introduction. I don't think I've ever heard someone talk about me in front of so many people before, and I don't think I've talked in front of so many people. So it's a day of first. I'd like to welcome all the students in the room. Whether you're working on your BSW, MSW, or PhD, this is ultimately your day. Congratulations on your accomplishments so far, and I'm grateful to spend this bit of time with you. 
Thank you to Diane from the BC Association of Social Workers and to Dr. Barbara Lee from UBC for your words about the BCASW, the Inspiring Social Work Award, and about Paul Chang. As we just heard, Paul Chang modeled what social work can and should be. His important work centered working alongside marginalized communities. To practice as a social worker in his legacy fills me with great pride and I feel very humbled to be giving this lecture today. It's such an incredible honor to be even considered for an award of this caliber, let alone to be selected as the recipient. For those of you that know me, you know how much I enjoy not being the center of attention, so this definitely pushes me outside my comfort zone. But being a social worker, you start to get used to being pushed outside your comfort zone. So I'm approaching this like any other challenge, with a deep breath, an internal pep talk, and a whole lot of chocolate. <laughs> I want to thank my colleagues who put together my nomination, Katie, Catherine, and Kay, three incredible social workers that I work with daily at St. Paul's. Any of you could just as easily be standing up here. Thank you for lifting me up in the work and for inspiring me to do better. Thank you for laughing with me and for all the times we roll our collective eyes together when we <laughs> encountered one too many barriers on the same day. I do not practice in isolation and collectively our social work practice is more impactful. I also want to thank Harvey and Teresa and Providence as a whole. Firstly, you gave me a chance to learn and develop my practice when I completed my MSW practicum with Providence. I guess you saw something in me because you still hired me after. <laughs> and I'm also grateful for the larger work of Providence that Harvey spoke about, and in particular being able to work in an organization that centers social justice as one of its core values. I suspect my practice may look different if I wasn't supported by these organizational values. And finally, I'm so fortunate to be supported by friends, family, and my partner, all of you had made it possible for me to be standing up here today. So I've been asked to speak about my relationship to social work and to try and inspire the students here today. This is no easy task and I make no promises. <laughs> When I started to reflect on my practice and what is important to me about social work, one thing that stood out is the important ways social work can contribute to individual community and social change. Working toward change is in fact one of the things that motivates me most. We all know that change can be multifaceted and have many different looks. Change can occur on many levels. Change can be slippery and feel like it is falling out of our grasp. At times, it can feel impossible or impossibly slow. Change often seems to be the most meaningful when people are able to define it for themselves. Change also often starts with us. Studying and working in the social work field also often changes us in the process. So when thinking about my practice, the other factor that really stood out to me is how to work for change in a way that is sustainable. How can I continue to nurture change in my practice? And how can I simultaneously cultivate a, su a sustainable practice? Based on my previous experience, when I finished my MSW and started my career as a social worker in healthcare, I knew that sustaining change and sustaining practice were both equally important to me. Again, no easy task. And it may go without saying, but I certainly don't have all the answers or a secret recipe but I can now talk about what matters most to me in my practice and in my relationship with social work. <laughs> this, however, is more accurately how I feel day to day in my practice. Some, sometimes I even succeed in not outwardly looking this way even though I feel this way internally, sometimes. This is also definitely how I felt when I started to sink in that I would be giving this lecture here today. <laughs> As this day approached, the nervousness amplified and the thoughts of self-doubt became louder. Me? What on earth of value do I have to say? These thoughts truthfully made it harder to prepare for this lecture. 
I spent a lot of time staring at a blank page, hoping some social work miracle would be bestowed upon me. The lecture would write itself, school is canceled for the semester. I hoped anything was possible. I also started to reflect on how self-doubt or feelings of incompetence have the potential, potential to impede my practice. How this type of self-doubt can get in the way of change and how it has in fact impacted my ability to sustain myself in this work. These thoughts, of course, aren't the only barriers to sustainability. As social workers know that social context is critical and that intersecting systems of oppression shape our experiences, including our very access to feelings of competency and confidence. And yet, despite these reflections, still accurate. I too attended the UBC School of Social Work. I started my MSW after working several years in the anti-violence field, where I worked with women who experienced violence in intimate relationships. I worked amongst a passionate group of women. The organization worked from a feminist intersectional lens, practiced frameworks that align with my values. I often said that I was working my dream job. After many years in this field, though, I started to hit a wall. I encountered what is so frequently talked about when it comes to this line of work or social work in general, burnout, or the many other terms for the nuances of this experience, moral distress, vicarious trauma, or simply stress. I pushed these feelings aside, probably for longer than was wise. Eventually, I was stuck. So I went back to school. <laughs> I came to my MSW looking to ground myself, to breathe new life into my practice. Could I be re-inspired? Was there still hope for my practice? Quick spoiler, the answer is yes. <laughs> I too sat in this orientation filled with nervous excitement and anticipation, plus a small part of me wondering what the heck I was doing here. <coughs> Whatever your reasons for pursuing social work education, hold on to those intentions. Also accompany them with a healthy curiosity about, about the ways in which they may change. The good thing about social work school, as you, as you may know, or as you will soon find out, is that there's a lot of time for reflection. You will write more reflective journals than you ever thought possible, and you will spend a lot of time thinking criti critically about different practice frameworks and building a framework that resonates with you. Retrospectively, I really appreciate why, even though at the time I'm sure I wasn't so enthusiastic. <laughs> this process of reflection, though, gave me the time and space to ask myself some hard questions about my relationship with work. In the end, this learning gave me the courage to try something new, to approach my practice in a new way, to see myself and my work in a different way, and to totally change my area of practice and start working in healthcare. As Harvey mentioned in my introduction, I currently work at St. Paul's. I work with the Addiction Medicine Consult Team. This is a specialized team primarily made up of physicians, which focuses on substance use assessment and treatment for people admitted to the hospital. I'm one of two social workers on the team, and my role is dedicated to working within the mental health program. So essentially this means I work on all the mental health units at St. Paul's with people who have current mental health and substance use concerns. A large part of my role is direct clinical work. Another aspect of my position is providing education and consultation to other clinicians as it relates to substance use. It gets pretty busy sometimes. I finished my MSW in 2015, and I started working at St. Paul's right after. Importantly, this meant that I started working in healthcare at the same time as the opioid overdose crisis in BC had escalated, and the consequences of an increasingly toxic drug supply were more profoundly felt. The only graph I have in my presentation. <laughs> As I'm sure you are aware, unintentional overdoses and overdose deaths rose dramatically in BC starting in 2014. The most recent data, which is up here, includes data up until June of this year and reflects this ongoing concern. 
This crisis has largely been attributed to fentanyl and fentanyl analogs contaminating the drug supply. However, it is also a product of ongoing war on drugs mentalities and failed drug policies, stigma, and the criminalization of substance use, especially for those communities that are already so criminalized due to poverty, colonialism, racism, and other interlocking systems of oppression. Just the other day, August 31st, was International Overdose Awareness Day. This is a day to raise awareness about overdose and to honor and remember the lives that have been lost. It is also a day to challenge stigma and to encourage action. Further, it is a day to recognize the grief so many feel as a result of each individual loss and the staggering number of collective losses. I remember all of the people I have worked with whose lives have been lost as a result of overdose and other substance use related harms. All losses that were preventable. I hope to work each day to honor and respect their memories. I started my social work practice on the addiction team then with a sense of urgency. What could I do? What more could we do? I felt compelled to put my practice, push my practice and to respond even if I didn't always know how. And even when, and this is often, I had a general idea of what direction to go in but had no idea how to actually get there. That familiar self-doubt and sense of incompetency that I spoke about earlier were frequent companions as I started my practice. I was just a new social worker. What could I do? How could I make change? Why would anyone listen to me? At times I looked around and it felt like others didn't share this sense of urgency. The literature tells us that people who use substances have some of the worst health outcomes and some of the most negative interactions with the healthcare system. For me, I couldn't just know this fact and not try and do something differently. Even if that meant doing something as small as being kind to a person admitted to the hospital, trying to get to know them, laughing at their jokes, and just simply working to build a positive relationship. What was clear to me though is that I needed to figure out ways to act. As this picture tells us, and I'll talk more about this photo in a minute, overdose deaths are preventable. What more could I do to foster change? I'm fortunate to work on a team that is focused on education and learning. As a team, we know that we have to try new things and find new ways for the healthcare system to respond. I found a community of practitioners that wanted to take risks. When I first started in this role at St. Paul's, uh, St. Paul's didn't have as many practices, resources, or services as it does now that are aimed at supporting people who use substances whatever their substance use goals are. This in and of itself gives me hope. At that time though, one thing that hadn't been rolled out yet as standard practice was the distribution of take-home naloxone kits or Narcan kits to patients admitted to the hospital. As an aside, naloxone or Narcan reverses opioid overdoses. You can get a kit at your local pharmacy. I encourage everyone to have one. But back to my story. So as I mentioned, when I first started working in this role, there was not a formal hospital protocol to dispense take-home naloxone kits. They were available in the emergency department, but weren't yet hospital-wide. Widely distributing naloxone kits is an effective public health strategy. This we know. Some very dedicated nurses were working on rolling out new policy that ensured patients admitted to any ward could be offered take-home naloxone training and receive a kit. But as I'm sure you can guess, bureaucracy takes time. A small group of us, mostly social workers and nurses, decided we couldn't really wait for the formal policy to roll out. Sometimes when you feel strongly about the importance of an intervention, you know you just need to act. So in the meantime, we pieced together an informal system and distribu distributed naloxone kits throughout the hospital. We provided education to patients at the bedside and had conversations about harm reduction. We walked through the hospital with a tote bag full of naloxone kits, and we did our best to reach as many people as we could. I also think it helped raise awareness among other healthcare providers about harm reduction and overdose response. It was an imperfect intervention, 
but we worked together to try and fill a gap. A handful of months later, the formal policy and rollout were in place, the naloxone kits are no longer stored in a tote bag, and they are much more widely and consistently available. I share this example because it highlights a few things for me. One, how a community of practitioners, social workers or otherwise, who share similar values are important ingredients in working towards change. We inspire each other and we take risks, however small, collectively. Secondly, it also highlights to me that sometimes we need to just act. We can't always wait for policy or bureaucracy because institutions are often slow and sometimes reluctant to change. We can't always wait for permission. So whatever area you practice in or will practice in, be sure to grab your tote bag and fill it with naloxone kits or something else that is acutely needed in your area of work and just act. It may be imperfect, you may even feel like you don't totally know what you're doing, probably like I did, but social workers can be the drivers of change in an organization and this is an important responsibility. So this picture is from a silent protest organized by the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs at the International Harm Reduction Conference held in Montreal in 2017. Activists protested during Federal Health Minister Jane Philpott's keynote, demanding that the government declare a federal public health emergency and also radically change drug policies, including ending prohibition and expanding harm reduction. Drug user activist groups and drug user liberation movements are at the center of creating broad level social change to address the overdose crisis and the harms of criminalization. Harm reduction services like safe consumption sites as well as improvements in the healthcare system were all advanced through the collective efforts and advocacy of people who use substances. This work is profoundly inspiring and has made considerable change in Vancouver. People who use substances also remind us that self-determination is critical and that systems and institutions must support self-determination. Clearly, self-determination is in line with social work values and ethics. However, in my experience, at times, this is not fully applied to people who use substances. Certainly, working in the hospital and in mental health in particular, paternalistic attitudes are widely present. The medical model is pervasive. There can be a sense of knowing what is best for people and a reflex to prescribe or mandate treatments. It can be difficult to center self-determination in this context, but it is possible. Often it is the social work voice on the team that can make a difference. When I meet with clients, I try and center this value of self-determination. I'm usually very aware of what the team wants, and sometimes I get asked to convince people of this thing or that thing, which is not a part of my practice. I instead try and listen to what the person I am working with wants. It probably sounds very obvious, but I think in institutions that have a history of paternalism and power over people it can actually be more difficult to truly listen to and respond to what people want for themselves. The healthcare system can be quick to judge or jump to conclusions. I worked once with a woman who shared with me as we walked on the rooftop garden at St. Paul's. I really want to change things, I really want recovery, but I think no one believes me. So sometimes it means having difficult conversations or having to deal with conflict with the rest of the interdisciplinary team. It can mean using your relationships to try and shift attitudes on your team so that all practitioners can see the change and the, and the resilience in the people we work with. Having difficult conversations is probably one of the top five regularly used social work skills. There should probably be a whole seminar on it, and I would sign up. <laughs> I ask people I work with what they like about substance use, how it works for them, what it has added to their lives. I'm curious about what relationship they wish to have with substance use and what stands in the way of that relationship. I listen for the ways I can align myself with their goals and values. I then work to amplify these goals and values to the rest of the team. 
In the mental health field, though, this can at times become more layered and more complex. Some of the people we work with are experiencing psychosis or hope beliefs that increase risk and the possibility of harm. We as practitioners at times get deeply concerned. Sometimes this caring starts to cloud our commitment to self-determination, mine included. My work has been most challenging when working with people who face additional barriers to accessing current life-saving treatments and harm reduction interventions due to their mental health. For some of the clients I work with, they simply don't believe that they can overdose. For others, they believe they have an internal immunity. And for others still, their mental health gets in the way of accessing current harm reduction services. Our already limited and fragmented mental health and substance use systems do not have the tools to fully respond. How then do we push for change? How do we still center the self-determination of the people we work with? How do we do this, especially when everything inside of us or inside of me feels an urge to become more protective? These are often questions I ask myself. It is in the face of these challenges that I've really needed to rely on my community of social workers. Again, I don't practice in isolation. We talk through these challenges and they compassionately remind me of my values. Most of these social workers, social workers are in the room right now and I thank you for holding me accountable. It has also meant that in these moments, it's time to double down on advocacy work. It is not the time to resign ourselves to the failures of the system. Rather than trying to find a way to make clients fit into an inadequate system, it is important to find a way to bend the system so it responds to their needs. Honestly, sometimes we probably just need to break the system altogether and rebuild it. Not a single one of us, though, can do any of this alone. We may not have the answers, and that old voice of self-doubt and inadequacy may have escalated in volume. We may want to blame or shame ourselves for not doing more. This has certainly been the case in my experience. But then I remember that for me, most importantly, it's simply critical that we don't give up. Let me come back to sustainability, because as I mentioned earlier, when I finished my MSW, one thing I learned is that both working toward change and sustaining my practice are equally important. Someone may be thinking, well, didn't you bring that before? <laughs> you are not wrong. <laughs> the urgency in which I started to approach this work combined with the sheer magnitude of the current crisis, results in a lot of burnout red flags waving all over the place. And many amazing frontline workers, activists, clinicians, and social workers have very understandably needed to step back from this work. And I too may need to do that at some point, because respecting our own capacity and our own limits is also a critical part of this work. But in the meantime, I know that I need to nurture and cultivate sustainability to look for ways to support my practice and to support my passion for this work. As I've alluded to many times, community for me is key. Coalitions support and amplify movements for change. Similarly, collectively, we can lift one another up in this work. We can share the struggle and the challenge. We can center our collective resilience. We can foster trusting relationships and collaborate in trauma-informed ways. We can hold hope in our clients' abilities to make change, but we can also hold hope in our own abilities to make change. We can learn from our shortcomings and compassionately hold each other accountable. For me, I also knew that I needed to ground myself in community outside of work. So after I started working at St. Paul's, and this kind of makes sense if I decided to try something completely different and I, out of my comfort zone and I started boxing. I guess I learned that part of what I needed to do to sustain my practice is to occasionally hit things in a socially appropriate and respectful way. <laughs> there can be a lot of pent up frustration as a product of being a social worker. I found a community mostly of other women in boxing. The mental focus, dedication, and patience required to try and learn this difficult sport is comforting, confidence boosting, and offers me respite. In boxing, good defense is key. Same could be said for social work. 
protecting your energy and taking care of yourself are a necessity. Honestly, I could do a whole other talk on how boxing made me a better social worker, but another talk. So as I wrap up, there are a number of key elements that are essential in my relationship to social work. For me, the first one is that working towards change is an important part of my social work practice, and we can take actions to create change. Secondly, a community supports and amplifies change. So you may find this community in school and in, in the new relationships you form during your education. Or perhaps you're uplifted by a community or by multiple communities that help you, in fact, get through school. It may be these communities that are actually the most central, or it may be a combination of all of those. Also, I learned to try and cultivate sustainability in my work. No one here needs to be a superhero and demonstrate exceptional feats of strength. And fourthly, I couldn't continue this work without finding spaces that nurture me. These things may have nothing to do with social work per se, but they really truly are critical ingredients to great practice. And finally, and you know I couldn't get up here without being a little bit political. Let us all work together to challenge the stigmatization of substance use and put an end to this stigma. Thank you. Uh, very much, um, uh, and we'd just like to invite uh, any questions or comments at this point. I think maybe Shirley's running around with microphones and Jenny. So if you have a question, we have a real quick. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Hi. Um, I was curious about when <laughs> when you started delivering some kits um, before it was passed through policy and if you had any if you ran into any problems either legally or bureaucratically and what that looked like I don't like my bosses <laughs> <laughs> um, we did it I think part of that really speaks to like the I think that when we're we said St. Paul's and at Providence the fact that we're backed by values of social justice and compassion that it does give us a fair amount of room sometimes, I think, to like practice in line with those values. Um, and so we didn't encounter a lot of challenges. There were some like logistical issues for sure, and like a little bit of uncertainty, maybe from like frontline staff about what we were doing and like where to keep these kits and like is it safe and like oh you're giving meals at the bedside and like that kind of stuff. But we were able to like work through that with education. Yeah, and it required the collaboration of like nursing and like a physician who helped us out with some of the you know, prescription parts of it at that time. Yeah. Good question. Hi. Oh, hi. Um, so, just listening to you, thank you for coming here and speaking with us. Um, you did mention like about your burnout, you mentioned about um, kind of the red flags. Um, I was wondering was kind of like the last straw for you, kind of like where you were like, oh, maybe I kind of have something to take care of myself kind of thing, and where did you draw the line? Like, how did you feel like um, I guess for me at that time, I was uh, kind of a newer practitioner in a lot of ways, so I think I didn't have as many good skills to maybe like have that self-awareness or recognize some of those concerns um, in my practice at that time. Um, so I think I just sort of like forged ahead for a long time until I kind of felt like I couldn't anymore, so I wouldn't recommend that strategy. Um, but I think it was like having people close to me, like either like colleagues or friends that were able to reflect back to me, like some of those concerns that I think really helped me to kind of take stock and reevaluate. Um, and then I think for me, now what I learned from that experience and what I learned in school and in my work now is that I'm a lot more mindful of that, and I think that I place maybe less like pressure on myself to just like be a superhero in this work or something, and I think that's been like very um, helpful in a lot of ways. Um, and then having like a really great team of people 
people that really kind of supports me and like checks in and is able to sort of monitor maybe those boundaries and limits for me when maybe I can't always see them for myself. So some of my great colleagues that remind me to take a lunch break and go home on time. Um, well, also because it helps me. Oh yeah, sorry, Catherine, who's my one of my great colleagues at St. Paul's. Um, she asked uh, how boxing makes me a better social worker. Um, I think for me, one thing is that it makes me leave on time, so I don't miss class. So that's good. Um, but I think for me, I knew I needed to do have some kind of outlet, like for all the like frustrations and like some of the like anxieties and some of the like anger that I would feel like doing this work um, and I knew I needed for me at least like a very kind of physical outlet for that um, and I'm not a sports person I've never played a sport before so just you know um, and so I think for me I found like a community in boxing and the gym I go to actually has like boxing classes specifically for people doing frontline work in the overdose crisis so there was like a shared community for like lots of reasons um, and so I was able to be real about that was what I was there for um, and that we could kind of share in that experience and then support each other in that way. So having that other community um, outside of work was really helpful. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering if, well, probably when we came up against uh, resource and time constraints with clients, how you cope with that? Oh, that happens a lot. <laughs> um, well, I think like working in the hospital, like we often have like discharge pressure, and so there is often a lot of time constraints in terms of like how much time we have to work with someone, and the system is often very slow too. So we're trying to like get people connected to resources or services or whatnot, and it's like that's not moving as fast maybe as like the institution wants, and social workers are often kind of caught in the middle of that tension. Um, and I think like for us, like again, I think it's having really strong support in your colleagues has helped and to also figure out ways like strategically how we can advocate collectively. So if that means advocating that we have more time, then that's like where we start with our advocacy work. Um, or if it means like, you know, advocating that like our resource respond quicker maybe than it normally does, then that's where we focus our attention. And often it's many of us advocating at the same time. Um, and that helps me to cope because I think for me to just be like, there's too much time. I have, I have time constraints and workload pressures and whatever, and not to work, practice in line with my values is something that really eats away at me. And so finding ways to try and, you know, enact my practice in that way despite those challenges, um, and having really good relationships, I think, with a lot of the like physicians and other team members that I work with. And then using the, and leveraging those relationships when you need to. Um, so I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of ways in which I draw on that background in my work. I think that in the anti-violence field, there is such a strong commitment often to like social justice or working from like an intersectional or anti-oppressive approach. And I think for me, having that foundation was really helpful then in terms of being able to maybe feel like more strongly or more confidently in that kind of lens and bringing that into healthcare, which is clearly a medical model and like doesn't necessarily uh, always support all of those values. Um, and having, and I think in the anti-violence field, it's like you are an advocate so much of the time. And so I think those like advocacy skills really kind of helped um, tra like translated well in working in healthcare. Um, and then I think having that like gendered lens, and I think so many of the 
um, as a piece that I think that we can sometimes miss in healthcare. There can be so many acute concerns, and sometimes we can kind of miss that piece. So trying to bring that lens, the edge mass lens, into my work in the hospital also has been helpful. <laughs> any any um, tips on having those difficult conversations with your colleagues? Any tips on having those difficult conversations with your colleagues when you're trying to create change? Uh, sometimes you have to do them even though they're really awkward. Um, or there are sometimes negative, some negative consequences to doing them, but doing them anyway, I think. I guess for me it's like, um, I work with so many different clinicians and physicians in particular because I work on so many units in the hospital and I think really trying to have like a good relationship um, at the beginning really helps because in this you can rely on that when you're then having a difficult conversation. And I think also just being really clear that your social work lens and your social work approach brings something of value to the, to the team and to like the collaboration on like treatment planning or whatever with the people we work with. And to not feel so much like it's like, oh, okay, the physician says this, so we like have to do that. Um, to know that you don't have to do that. And that there's like, if you're strong in, I think your practice and why, what your rationale is for an intervention, I think it helps me to have those conversations a bit easier because I feel like a sense of conviction about what I'm talking about. And to be strategic, you get to know people and you get to know where you can kind of push and where it's a little bit harder. Um, and so kind of finding, knowing your landscape a little bit helps. And then, yeah. And then I go back to my office, which is always stocked with some chocolate and snacks. And then I go there and then we like eat all the chocolate for our moms. <laughs> Space where it's not necessarily already appreciated or realized. Well, that's a good question. That's a hard, a hard one. I think. I think for one thing, I would say that maybe at Providence, compared to maybe some other places in healthcare, is that there um, is like social work is like fairly valued. That doesn't mean like every individual person in the hospital values it, but like organizationally, it's like quite valued, and so I think that helps a lot um, because you know you feel like kind of the sense of your back maybe advocacy for the social work like lens or profession. Um, and then I think that it's like, yeah, I think for me it's like just being able to like articulate like the impact of social determinants of health, the consequences of maybe not taking that into consideration. Sometimes you have to frame it in language that the other healthcare providers maybe it might speak to them more. Um, and so I think those are ways that I and then I think it shows collectively over time through our work. So, um, uh, a very warm thanks to you and to the uh, uh, great example set for our students. And I'd just like to invite um, Mary and Ann to the stage to, uh, to give you your award. <laughs> and I'd just like to also take this moment to thank Mary again for her generous donation, um, which means that we can have this kind of uh, a work we can highlight this kind of really important work and, and highlight the individuals doing it. So this is this is what we expect you to all go forward and do in your <laughs> side. So thank you very much, Jacqueline, for your We'll take just a little break and then we have a panel at 1.30 or for some reason we have it at 1.35 because we like to start just off the hour. 
Uh, but we have a panel, and uh, so we invite the students to come back for that. Jacqueline and her friends are free to go. <laughs> Anyways, thank you very much for, for uh, this program and your time.